Chapter 11, Body, Part 1, Moving Into and Out of the Mind-Body Split. Birthing My First Child I am 21 years old, lying on my back in the hospital, breathing in time with what they call, quote, labor pains, unquote. I don't sense them that way. My training in natural childbirth breathing techniques is paying off. The contractions aren't painful exactly, though they are extremely intense, building to a crescendo and then subsiding. By consciously working to entrain the rhythm of my breathing and sounding to the wave-like motions of each contraction, I move in tune with them. By breathing in and out with the alternating flow of internal events, I feel at home, at one with my body, the spectacular energy of this utterly natural process. Since I can't stop the process anyway, since it is out of my control, I have only one alternative to becoming one with my body, and that is panic. When I lose focus, I panic. Zooming out of my body, I separate myself off from the contractions and tense against them, feel pain, extreme pain, horrible, unbearable agony. Trust and panic. These two attitudes, the first of moving my consciousness down into my body, becoming one with it, and surrendering to its natural process, and the other of remaining separate from my body, defending myself against whatever is going on within it, have colored every experience of my life. They are also the two ways people tend to view any process involving the birth of something new. Either we trust the process, move into it, go with it, or fearful, panicky, we tense against it and experience pain. Growing up into separation. The first attitude, that of trust, is inborn. We come into this world like other baby animals at one with our bodies. Consciousness is oceanic. We don't sense ourselves as individuals. That must be learned. The process of growing up in this society can be described as that of separating out mind from body, taking control of the body as an instrument which we learn to bend to our will. According to developmental psychologists, by the time we're 12 years old, our minds have completely separated from our bodies. The famous philosophical remark of Descartes, I think, therefore I am, has become real. We identify with our minds and think of our bodies as part of the external world. That world is now mirrored inside our minds as images and ideas. Substituting images and ideas for things, we manipulate them according to the rules of formal logic. The more logical we become, the more we think we can control external reality, including the reality of our own body. The body is external to the self, the mind, and is relegated to the status of an object, mechanical. Like any machine, we think it's predictable, controllable, and its parts can be taken apart and put back together again. There is no mystery to it. There are only problems, and any problem once analyzed, can be solved. Birth and death as mysteries. Everything is a problem, that is, except death and birth. Death remains a mystery, no matter how we try to avoid it. Death is inevitable, and we do not understand it. We can't predict it, or control it, or stop it, so we find it terrifying. Nor do we understand birth. Though very few contemporary mothers experience birth's profound mystery, they are so drugged and or so afraid. The mysteries of death and birth both arise out of processes which involve dramatic transformations of the body. In the first, the spirit or life force leaves the body and it putrefies, dissolves back into compost from which new bodies of all kinds are formed. Some of us die suddenly, with no time to prepare for this great passage. Others know they are dying and have time to consciously create closure. Unlike death, we normally have nine months to prepare for birth. I remember my awe 
in feeling the little heartbeat for the first time, the heart of another human being, separate from me, living in my body. My body had transformed into a vessel and nutritive source for the creation and ravenous growth of another living being. My body knew exactly what it was doing and did not need me, my mind, to help it, to inform it of anything, nor could my mind or will control it. My body was proceeding according to its own laws, laws which were both natural and inevitable. As my pregnancy advanced, I noticed how my consciousness, usually outside and above my body, was moving in and down to center in my womb. I, my mind, had become one with this ongoing physical transformation. I had never felt so grounded, so real in my life. I loved being pregnant. By the time I went into labor, it was easy to do the breathing exercises I had practiced, easy to trust my body's mastery of this climactic part of the process, too. After 11 hours, the second stage of labor, pushing, began. I was wheeled on a gurney into the gleaming delivery room and hoisted onto the table under steely bright lights. My feet were positioned awkwardly in stirrups. My body was draped, and the macho, wisecracking doctor sat on a tool behind the drape. Pushing felt like they said it would, like having a bowel movement. So why wasn't I squatting? My baby's head was so big and his eight-and-a-half-pound body so large that pushing took extreme effort. Finally, as the head began to crown and then squeezed out, followed by Sean's slippery body, there, right then and there, in the sterile hospital delivery room with the gleaming steel lights and the macho doctor, I slipped into another dimension, entering sacred time and space. For one brief, stunning moment, I experienced childbirth as the template for creation and identified myself, my body, as woman, the creatrix. Many years later, I would call this goddess consciousness. At that time, May 1964, I would struggle to retain even a glimpse of that uncanny ancient knowing. Return to mind-body alienation. Two weeks later, I was rocking in the new rocking chair with my new baby, nursing him, and feeling strange, knowing that this was supposed to be the most beautiful experience of my life, and it was not. Despite the tug of his perfect little lips sucking on my nipple and the tug of my womb in response, I felt disembodied. My mind was cathecting back, out of body. Already, I was returning to my pre-pregnancy state of mind-body alienation, where I would remain for years. My children suffered from being with a mother who was distracted, not there. I suffered, too, wanting to feel my children, but terrified. I thought I feared being caught up in the role of mother, of becoming just like my mother, whose eight children, I thought, had rendered her a slave to household chores. In reality, I was terrified of feeling my own children's pain at being abandoned by their mother. And as I would come to realize many, many years later, that terror masked the original one of feeling emotionally abandoned by my own mother when I was a child. So while my mind sought freedom, dominion, the capacity to choose and become whatever I wanted, my body's pain and longing to remember its bond with its child and its mother continued. The tragedy of this profoundly ambivalent attitude towards my own mothering, an attitude which paralyzed me, rendered me incapable of committing to either myself or my two little boys, would lead six years later to that first peritonitis attack when I finally had to take charge, take responsibility for my life, or die. Six months later, I left my children with their father, a karmic choice for which we all pay dearly. Logic and instinct. The split between mind and body, between logic and instinct, painful as it is when we begin to feel it, usually goes unnoticed. Once the mind separates out completely, there is no more pain because there's no more feeling. We have numbed ourselves to our own bodies in order to achieve rationality 
logic. Our entire culture is geared towards producing this duality in each person within the first 12 years of life, though we don't know it. We identify with the mind and treat the body as other, one more object in the room. Any duality, when unrecognized, produces conflict. The pole which is denied fights for recognition, and when it is not granted, resorts to sabotage. The body introduces an unconscious countercurrent to the mind's conscious intent, creating ambivalence, emotional paralysis, and finally, illness. My ambivalence towards mothering and the resulting peritonitis is an example of what happens when the conflict between mind and body becomes acute. We all remember this conflict, how it raged during adolescent years, especially those of us growing up during the 50s when the strong new juices flowing through our bodies were both thrilled to and simultaneously denied. For me, this made weekly confessions to the priest exercises in hypocrisy. Over and over again, I promised never to kiss my boyfriend that way again, knowing full well that, despite my best intentions, I would. I hated myself for my hypocrisy, for not being able to control my body. I hated my body, its power over me. Earlier, as a nine-year-old, I had had the good fortune to be one of the few girls who love horses to actually get her own horse, only because I begged my father for so long and so insistently that he finally gave in, promising to get me that horse if I would do all the dishes for the entire family, there were six children at this time, for a whole year. I think he assumed I would be unable to fulfill my end of the bargain. Immediately, I got out a big sheet of paper, drew a grid on it with 365 squares, and started crossing out each day. I was lucky. Not only did my busy and preoccupied father keep his end of the bargain, but my own logical mind was so developed at that early age that I was capable of holding a focus for an entire year. Moreover, for that brief period of time, logic and instinct united to get me that horse so that, running her bareback through the fields, my legs spread to embrace her sweaty, pounding muscles, I was in my body, and our two bodies were one. My horse, Goldie, golden sunlight, became my first obsession. When I wasn't riding her, I was drawing her or pretending I was her, crawling around with one of my brothers or sisters on my back. Everything she ate made my mouth water. Hay, grass, oats, carrots, apples. She was my body, my big, beautiful, glorious, strong, swift, full-hearted, heroic Amazon body. She was the body I never had. Riding her bareback, racing into the wind, I could be anything do anything, go anywhere. Nothing could stop me. My mind and body joined with Goldie's body. We were at one with the natural world. On Goldie, for the one and only time in my young life, I was happy. Then I turned 13 and met Dick and was faced with a choice. Either keep Goldie or sell her so that I could spend the money to ski with Dick. I sold my horse. And that brief spell of communion with the natural world was over. Now came the torment of puberty, as experienced by a saintly Catholic girl who loved a fine young man within a strict puritanical culture. The body's desire was wonderful, terrible. I loved it, longed for full communion. I hated it, refusing to surrender. I loved it, wanting him to push closer, further, deeper. I hated it knowing I would have to confess once again. By the time I was a junior in college, the dichotomy between mind and body, between logic and instinct, had gone on so long that my vigilant virginity was exhausted. I wanted to experience sex, and I wasn't going to do it unless I was married. In November of 1963, I was faced with a decision to go back with my original high school boyfriend, Dick, whom I still loved, and who would years later become my second husband, or to stay with my college boyfriend, whom I admired for his talent, but did not love. Instinct would have led me back to Dick. Yet the most authentic choice I intuitively knew even then was to choose neither man 
to learn how to live on my own. I also consciously knew that I was so afraid to be alone that I wouldn't allow it as an option. Cynical, hating myself as a coward, in a sort of perverse negation of rationality, I flipped a coin. I flipped a coin to decide my own future. I flipped a coin to decide which man to marry. The present boyfriend won, and soon after, I married him. That early decision to flip a coin to decide my fate rather than do what I was afraid of may have been the unconscious impetus for the personal rule I made later after divorcing that first husband to always do what I was afraid of. A decade later, when I finally yielded to instinct and reunited with Dick, I told him the story of flipping the coin, and he replied that during an earlier time when we were apart, He had also flipped a coin, and that unlike me, when the coin came up to not remain with me, he felt so badly that he knew it was the wrong choice. For him, instinct was primary, and he honored it. Free love and addiction. Like so many in my generation, after that disastrous first marriage, I ran headlong and dancing, giggling, stoned into the arms of free love. I thought that I was being spontaneous, natural, free. Actually, I was treating the most intimate of acts as if it were casual entertainment. I convinced myself that I was satisfied with mechanical sex, and my heart, already locked up, tightened into a fist. I was running, pell-mell, from one experience to another, without slowing down to fully feel them. I could not afford to fully feel them, because if I did, I would be inundated by an upsurge of buried pain. I stayed on top of the anxiety by being busy. During those times when I was not doing something and anxiety surged, I would pick up another cigarette, or pour another cup of coffee, or smoke another joint, or eat another sweet roll, anything to dull the continuous murmuring panic. By the time I was 40 years old, I could not go on living that way. Something had to change. I was physically and emotionally and spiritually exhausted, and I knew it. And I knew that until I stopped smoking, I wouldn't be able to accomplish anything, because my own disgust with this habit would undermine any project I undertook. I hated being a slave to something, and once again felt like a hypocrite. Me, who had always loved freedom, caught in the vice grip of this addiction. What is freedom? Freedom was my most important value, had been for a long time, but my understanding of what this value meant was changing. My generation's love of freedom as doing whatever we wanted without thought for the consequences was mutating into something more intangible. I was beginning to glimpse a much more spacious sense of freedom, the capacity to be truly present to be fully here and now, open, relaxed, and trusting. While I had glimpses of this other, this never-never land, this nirvana, what I felt most of the time was a terrible urgency to understand, to know what was going on, to figure it all out, to control. I was on the front lines of a war, on guard and alert to danger from any direction. Along with elusive hints of what I now call presence, I was beginning to sense that I was haunted by a shadowy past which sent up continuous tendrils of muted terror. Another sensation went along with this, that of feeling dense, stuck, rigid. I was beginning to notice that somehow, somewhere, sometime, my body had hardened into a continuous fight-or-flight state of readiness. I became fully conscious of the defensive stance of my body one early spring morning while lying in bed. I had just awakened and was aware of a robin singing in the tree just outside. Though I was intellectually thrilled to hear this harbinger of spring after a long mountain winter, I was simultaneously struck by the realization that my body felt like a thick cement wall filling the space between me and the robin's song, that this wall was preventing me from being fully present to the music. 
I vowed then and there to work to thin the wall, to transform the wall into a membrane. Intending that my body become like a drum, I imagined every cell resonating to the beautiful sounds of birdsong. Burdened by the dead weight of the cement wall, I vowed that early June morning to transform my body to the point where my entire self would become fully and centrally present in each and every moment. This, I realized, would be true freedom. But how? How to get there from here? <laughs>